Um, I'm going to go ahead and record it because somebody asked me if I would. Um, so I'm Steve Krause, and I'm one of the co-instigators of this. So thanks for coming. It's been, it's been fun. And I'm going to talk briefly about uh, MOOCs um, and some of my recent experiences with them. You've, maybe you've heard about these in the news. These are massive online open courses. And they started as kind of an experiment. If you go look these things up on like uh, uh, Wikipedia or something like that, or if you go to um, <clears throat> look up these two guys, George Siemens, I think the Siemens, does that sound right? I think that's right, and, and Stephen Downs, who are both Canadians. They are kind of the original coiners of the term. And their ideas were for uh, MOOCs were these sort of community-oriented courses around a sort of a very general topic and it was a very decentral, centralized kind of thing. So there was a website, but then, you know, they encouraged people to set their other websites and, you know, Facebook pages and networks and emails and all kinds of stuff like that. But what's happened over the last, uh, I guess, about year, give or take, is this, is this become uh, monetized. <clears throat> and the way it's really taken off, there's been a couple different um, players in this, but the big one right now is Coursera. And Coursera is a Silicon Valley startup company that was started by two uh, Stanford professors, I, their names escape me right now. Um, uh, one of them is a woman who's got a really interesting TED talk that I linked to in one place in my blog. The other one's a computer science guy. And they, they're, by monetize, I mean they've raised uh, millions and millions of dollars in venture capital and have bought and have gotten um, uh, you know, dozens and dozens of major universities to buy into the proposition of creating these MOOCs. I mean, if you go look at their lists of universities that are um, creating these classes, it's kind of a, it matches up pretty closely to various lists that you'll find for the top 50 universities in the world. So I'm talking, uh, well, not Harvard, because Harvard and MIT have their own consortium, but I'm talking, you know, Stanford, Princeton, uh, University of Pennsylvania, Michigan, uh, I'm sorry. All kinds of all kinds of places like this. <clears throat> I have a lot of stuff. I've been I've been really. I don't. I, I can't I can't tell you exactly why I become as obsessed with these things as I have. But I have become really obsessed with the whole thing, and so I've been blogging about it a lot lately. Uh, there. So if you just it's just the category of MOOCs. Um, so there's a lot more to it. Uh, I've taken a couple of these MOOCs. I took one that was actually a little bit different from the Coursera thing. It was taught by this guy named, um, his last name is Bonk. I can't think of his first name right now. I know, Curtis Bonk. Curtis Bonk, I think is his name. He's a guy at uh, University of Indiana who's a big education online guy. Uh, and that was a, a, a MOOC about online teaching. But the one that I really spent the most time with that falls into the category of uh, what these traditional things are supposed to look like is this course called Listening to World Music. And it was a um, kind of a gen ed uh, music class. And one of the reasons I signed up for it is because when I was undergraduate, uh, one of the last classes I took because I needed just credits to graduate was a, you know, music appreciation class. And I thought, oh, well, that would be kind of like that, you know. And it was kind of. Um, started off with about 30,000 students, and this is one of the things that Coursera does a lot. They basically will roll out these press releases saying 50,000 students have signed up for X or whatever. But I, I think that those numbers are very misleading because 30,000 students sign up, but you realize that what happened was 30,000 people signed up to say, what the hell is this Coursera thing? And then they're there for about 15 minutes and then they, they leave. But anyway, a lot of students, <clears throat> the basic format for these things has, all, at least all the ones I've seen, is very sage in the stage, uh, lecture-driven video lectures um, with quizzes and tests. Now, there's discussion forums in these things, but so far from the ones I've seen from Coursera, they don't count for anything. In other words, there's a streaming conversation going on about different topics, but it's not, a, it's not as if there's some sort of you know, value, like a grade or something associated with it. It's just this sort of mishmash uh, discussion kind of thing. And, I, and there's a lot of different things I could talk specifically about with this, and I'm going to talk more specifically in a second about the writing uh, assignments. But I have to say my biggest complaint about the Coursera course that I took from so far was what I described as sketchy production values, because it's not just video lectures. It's really, really badly done video lectures. And so I want to share with you just for a minute, one minute of this. And I don't mean this is to insult the professor who did this, because I'm sure she's a lovely, fine person and in a face-to-face -face class and 
she's perfectly smart and stuff like this, but just just take a look at this video. Welcome everybody to um, the to I can't really hear it. It doesn't really matter if you hear it though. Oh, yeah. Okay, so this is the next implant when we look at the CIA map, which is a source of public access to the map. We see that actually there's not a specific implant. The tuba is within the Russian Federation. Yeah. Um, so if you see where that red um, arrow is this. over there, the red arrow. Okay. Well, do you see how she's and pointing? Country of a, yeah, that's, all, that's all I'm really trying to get across here. This. This, this, this is her. This is her. This is the sophisticated lecture that Coursera is dumping millions and millions of dollars into. Is someone to stand in front of a green screen to say, "There's a low front over here"? I think. I don't think so. That's that's just a prop to. And then the other thing, of course, is that, and this is also to me kind of like. I don't know, sketchy. Sketchy production is that uh, all the content, all the music content for the class, they pushed it all out to YouTube. So in other words, it's a music class. It's a music class for God's sakes. And they didn't even have any of the music within the course shell of, with any sort of quality or anything else. It was all YouTube videos of one sort. And you stopped it with a beautiful <laughs> Yeah, that's, nice. that's, that's a good luck. Oh. Poor Carol. <clears throat> well, let me talk a little bit more specifically about the writing assignments for the class because this class had weekly writing assignments. This is a seven-week course, and there were six writing assignments because in the last week there was a final. Um, but there was a weekly writing assignments of three or so paragraphs, and I say that many wrote more because one of the discussions that emerged uh, in the discussion thread was what assignments got ten as a what 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 you know things that people that got a perfect score. And it was clear that most of the ones that got it, was very clear that one of this, uh, the, the writing assignments that got the really good scores were significantly longer than three paragraphs, or what I think of as three paragraphs. Um, they were based on prompts for the class, and we can talk about some of the nature of those prompts if we have time or whatever. They're so-so, whatever. Uh, they were peer-graded based on one rubric for all six assignments that covered five areas on a ten-point scale. And this is the rubric. I don't know how well you can see it. I just... And you can find this on the website, by the way, if you want to go to Coursera.org. Is it org or com? I can't remember. But, but you go to Coursera, and then you can look up the World Music Class, and you can find all this stuff right there. You can just sign up for the course and look at it. But this is it. This is the rubric. It's on a scale from 0 to 2. Um, style, unintelligible, inappropriate, uh, coherent, clearly succinct. Um, strength of argument, unconvincing, convincing, convincing, and convincing and pedestrian versus convincing and nuanced. I'm assuming that since most of, most of us have taught writing before and have probably ventured into the realm of first year composition that you, I don't need to do a lot of prompting to explain, that's kind of not very clear. You know, nuance versus pedestrian. A lot of my freshmen have trouble with that. The other five one, the other two would be uh, integration of personal response to music with critical thought. Not happening, the two are integrated, but clumsily. And it is clear that the two are integrated, even though the critical response may be at odds with personal reaction. Say so zero, one, two. Okay. This is the scale that was it was used for all the writing assignments. And this is the what when you graded the assignments, you had to go through and you check the boxes. Okay, so in other words, you went through and said, on this one I gave it a one, a two, or a zero for all of them. Does that make sense? So some obvious problems. First off, a scale of zero to two, you know, if you take a gen ed psychology class where they were talking about how you'd build a survey, they would explain you can't have a scale from zero to two. Because zero, even though th they think that that means a low score, zero means nothing, right? In other words, you would only give someone a zero on something as if it didn't, wasn't there, right? And then your choices are one or two. Okay, you know, so I don't understand why they just stuck with that. One rubric for all the assignments is obviously problematic since the assignments are different and have, have different uh, calls and things like that. But I could, suppose if it was a more general rubric, it could have worked if they would have talked about the rubric. But of course, they didn't talk about the rubric at all. There's no norming or training for this at all. The rubric has existed. The discussion, that you know, the grading happened, and, and that was that. The, <coughs> nothing. And there was no way to measure the quality of the evaluations that students gave. So like, there's this Eli project here that you know, Bill, et cetera, et cetera, trying to um, um, you know, 
pull off and do in some interesting ways. But it wasn't even something like minimally sophisticated. It was, it was, there was nothing. There was no, there was no accountability for people creating this thing. And there was no interaction at any point in time by anybody con who constituted an instructor. That is, no graduate assistants, not the professor had anything to do with how the grading process was going on. The only extent that they got involved with it at all in the discussion was about some concerns regarding plagiarism. Um, so how did I do? Well, I talk about this in my blog a lot, but just briefly, the first three weeks I did, I took it, did it pretty straight up. You know, I got the prompt, sat down on my computer, said, okay, I can't have a lot of time to do this because I've got things to grade and things to do, but I'll take it seriously, wrote things up and things like that. And I got grades between 10 and 8. <coughs> the reason why I got 8 a couple times is because I was late in handing some stuff in or, or posting some grades and things like that, but I did fine. And then in week 5, I decided, I'm getting kind of bored with this, let's try a couple experiments here. And so what I did was, for the semi-plagiarized essay, is... And I can't remember the exact nature of the prompt. We could go look it up. But uh, the first part of the first paragraph was on topic. Okay? And I think it had something to do with copyright. And then the second part of the first paragraph, I went into this thing about Disney World. You know, Disney and copyright and stuff like that. Sort of, it's kind of on topic, but not really. The second paragraph, I completely and totally lifted from my own blog. and had nothing to do with anything. I just copied and pasted a paragraph and dumped it in. And then the third paragraph, I uh, wrote up and did, you know, it kind of like brought the conclusion again. I got an 8.5. And one of the comments was very detailed and said, I think that, that some of this stuff is coming from an unattributed source. And then one of the comments was cool and check out some cool tunes and he left me a link to some beat music from Australia. <laughs> The sixth, last week I was really short on time and so I literally wrote something for 15 minutes like a speed, kind of like almost free writing-esque kind of thing. And, you know, I'll grant you I've written for a while and so I guess maybe it makes more sense than some other things that people, like my freshman when they write for 15 minutes, but still, not very much, I get 8.5. So the difference between actually working hard and cheating um, and, or just not working at all in this class was minimal at best as far as the brain thing goes. So a couple things that I learned from this whole thing, um, and I, there's a lot more to talk about and read about and think about with this, but the first thing is, is maybe this is something we all know already, which is content scales great. Uh, you know, this, these, and as, if, as MOOCs as a content provider, great idea. It's like a book. You know, you can have millions and millions of people looking at this thing. The teaching of it doesn't scale very well at all, and teaching writing scales really, really, really poorly. And that's one of the reasons why all of us have been advocating for years that a class like first year composition should be 25 students as opposed to 100 students, right? Um, the, if, I, if they had come to me and said, what do you want to do to improve this, actually make this be more writing centric or have something to do with writing? I would have said, you should grade the discussion forums. So in other words, require students to post in these discussion forums about different topics within the class, and then simply uh, tell students to rate the quality of the responses, much in the same way that people rate the quality of reviews that you get from Amazon.com or uh, Digit kind of things or something like that. And basically, it seems like to me that you would see a pattern of quality responses from other students in the class would be pretty... Uh, easy to figure out. The, the last thing I'll say is that, you know, and at face value, this MOOC stuff, especially to, to those of us who've been teaching for a while, seems completely and totally ridiculous. How could the real world really imagine that the way to solve the problems of general education in this country is to create these websites with tens of thousands of students taking these courses and that that somehow will substitute for filling your genetic class here kind of thing. It strikes me as goofy too, but at the same time, a lot of people are dumping a lot of money into this. And you know, there's this, these things are getting a lot of attention from a lot of institutions. So I think the thing that one thing that I learned from this that I hope people take away from this is the Cindy Self motto of you gotta pay attention because if we don't pay attention to what's going on with this stuff, we're gonna, we're going to be all become graders in some giant MOOC of a freshman comp class operated from Princeton or something. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, 